Today we continue in our examination of the first bestseller in automotive fiction and the initiator of a subgenre which was very successful during that time called motor romance, the story of a couple that usually falls in love, sometimes falls out of love, is a variation on the theme because of the automobile, because of driving together, riding the automobile together, going on a trip, having an accident, meeting on the side of the road because one of them needs rescuing, and it's not necessarily the woman who needs to be rescued. At the center of this kind of narrative is the dynamic in this new kind of couple, in this modern kind of relationship. Because the relationship itself will never be completely disconnected from the use of the technology. So what's different about the genre is that the technology is not just a pretext for the meeting of the two people in the couple. It remains as an integral part within their lives. In this case, in The Lightning Conductor from 1902, published in a book format in 1903 by Alice Williamson, the couple is Molly, the daughter of a, an American millionaire, so a member of the American aristocracy, and Jack Winston. But Jack has a split personality, plays two parts in the novel. Because most of the time, Jack is not Jack, does not present himself as British aristocracy. Rather, he pretends to be James. And as James, he pretends to be a driver for hire who has been generously offered by his alleged master to Molly because Molly has been left by her, her own driver, the driver she hired in England. And only at the end of the book, <coughs> James <coughs> will come out to Molly and reveal that he's in fact Jack, which means that every emotion, every feeling she was experiencing in his company is now completely justified. She can surrender to her romantic feelings and plan her life as a married woman with this man who previously was not worthy of her full attentions. Yes, she was really fallen in love with him, but experiencing also a lot of guilt for falling in love with someone outside her social class in an environment where classes, barriers between the classes, were indeed very important. In terms of the power dynamic in this couple, when you're reading the readings, the excerpts from the novel that I posted as required reading, keep in mind the following, more importantly. There is the social framework and within the accepted social framework Molly is the boss right she is in command and Jack when he plays the part of James the driver is the servant so she is she, she has the leadership from the social point of view. And that's very important. And as we said, keep in mind that during the same period, the first version of the feminist movement was introducing new themes in society in reference to the power dynamics within a married couple and in general between men and women. Then... There is the use of the technology. When it comes to the technology, 
to the exciting moments they spend riding the automobile, he takes the leadership as the driver, as the expert, as the one who can teach Molly how to drive, how to fix the car, how to operate the car in general. However, even though he clearly has the leadership at the beginning, you have a change, a transformation occurring throughout the story because the more Molly becomes familiar with the technology, competent and able to drive, and the more this dynamic changes, shifts, right? She becomes his peer, his equal. The gender gap is almost eliminated. Of course, there are all kinds of nuances because when he is driving at high speed, she feels secure because of his abilities, proven, demonstrated abilities to operate this new technology. When she is driving, she still has him by her side, reassuring her that she can do this. So it's not a complete reversal in terms of leadership when she's driving as opposed to when he is driving. And as I said, when you read the readings and then work on the assignment that is due next week, consider the counter examples when Molly is not really a completely new model for women and still shows traces of the traditional power dynamics where you find the woman usually in a subordinate role. So there are changes in this, but no complete radical revolutionary changes. And then there is the third element. And that's crucial to understand. The third element, the social leadership, the technical leadership. So the social leadership, she's on top. The technical leadership, he's on top, but this changes through the novel. The third element is the thrill, the excitement provoked by the technology, by the sensation of speed. Now, when you find references to what the actual speed, it's nothing, right? At some point she says, we were going 12 or maybe 14 miles per hour. That's fine. Put yourself on one of those cars, an open top car, lots of vibrations, lots of noises, the smell of the gasoline. It's a very physical experience, unlike anything else that existed until the 1890s. The thrill, the excitement of the ride is a crucial element because it mimic the romantic tension or even the erotic tension. That is to say, not only are they sharing the trip, traveling together on the automobile, but by virtue of sharing the physical excitement provoked by moving on the automobile at high speed, they get physically closer. There is a biological synchrony. There is a connection that goes beyond the social barrier, the, so the assumed, alleged social barrier, or the gender barrier, men and women. Okay? So, as I did on Tuesday, I'll go quickly through a series of passages just to point out some key elements and provide a model for your own reading and analysis of this text. At the end of Tuesday's class, we stopped to consider the relevance of this sentence where Molly says, I felt small in the presence of people in England with automobiles. This idea that the consumer who's already the target of a marketing campaign that is socially engineered feels compelled to purchase a new product because her whole identity, public identity, public persona, depends on the product itself. Once she envisions 
her life with this product, anything in her current situation is less than, including herself. Okay, so this is a theme we'll find in other texts about the automobile, whereby the new identity of the user and the owner of the automobile is scaffolded, supported by the connection with the technology. And being a modern woman, Molly travels with a camera, this kind of camera, she talks about the brand, it's a Kodak, and it was probably very similar to this one, which is very portable, about this big, portable compared to the big camera used by photographers. You have a key connected to a mechanism to advance the film, and you have a button to take pictures. She takes pictures of the automobile. And you know very well yourselves how very often taking a picture is a proxy for acquiring a product. I cannot have this product right now, but I'll take a picture because I want one. And at least I have that picture with me, not just as a reminder, but also as a proxy for the very product that I want to own. So consider how even the process of Molly getting to own and ride on an automobile is structured a little bit like a romance, right? The anticipation, the desire, the expectations before this actually happens. Of course, the owner of the car, of the German car that she will purchase in England, is portrayed as a dashing man, elegant, beautiful, looks like aristocracy, but part of his beauty, of his attractiveness, is the fact that he owns this automobile. This automobile makes him more special as well, right? And then ownership of the automobile it translates into lifestyle. Right? He says, in order to convince Molly to buy or to use reverse psychology, what a pity we, Molly and her aunt, could not, couldn't do our tour on a motor car. Right? Getting the car means to enjoy a different level of experience, whatever you are doing. And in terms of being aware of one's public identity, there are other clues that this is relevant dispersed in the story. For example, this idea that as an American, you go to Europe and you are seen as a different tribe. And people will see you do things that are not customary in Europe. This is true to this day. And say, well, well they, they are Americans. What can you do? Right? It would be like Italians making fun of Americans ordering a cappuccino at the end of the lunch, which is a big no-no, big taboo for Italians. No cappuccino with a meal or, uh, in, in general, in the later uh, times of the day. But this signal, signals that you are going through a trip, even in a foreign a series of foreign countries, and people are looking at you. People are assessing, evaluating your role, your identity, your level of power. And before, earlier, we reviewed the sentence where she says, I felt small without the car. The opposite can be found in this passage where, by virtue of, getting the car, she will be able to say, like the Count of Monte Cristo, the world is mine, right? This sense of empowerment connected to a product. And this is a new thing. It's nothing to us because we are bombarded with marketing campaigns based on this assumption. But it's entirely modern 120 years ago.
right? You understand how this very little sentence has a lot of significance. And notice how the seller of the car, talking to Molly, drops a reference, a casual reference to the automobile. He went on to tell of the wonderful journeys, lifestyle, right? I have a car, I can do things other people cannot enjoy. The wonderful journeys he'd made in his car, which we might have noticed outside, right? From the very beginning, the car is an extension of his public persona. Because there aren't many cars outside. That may be the only car outside that restaurant, right? 1902, the car is an expensive toy for the wealthiest members of society. We are talking about the price of a car equivalent to the price of an apartment or a small house in many instances, with some exceptions because there were small cars as well sometimes uh, that were cheaper. But celebrities, basically celebrities, the aristocracy, the wealthy, the politicians had cars, not regular people. So if you have an automobile outside, the implication is people would walk by and wonder who's the owner of that. Someone in that restaurant owns the automobile and therefore that person is a unique individual by virtue of owning that car. And the car, allegedly, according to the owner, has been customized. And therefore, it is unique. Um, and this is Molly's reaction. By the time we were half through lunch, I was envying him, his car. But the importance of this feeling is that this can be mirrored. That is to say, Molly's expectation is that other people will envy her once she gets the car. And therefore, it becomes a magical product in terms of affirming your presence, your role, your centrality in public society. And feeling as if life wasn't worth living because I couldn't have it to play with, right? The sense of diminution, the sense that your life before and after the product is completely different. And again, to this day, they're selling you the experience, not the car. Commercials shown on TV about cars are not saying the suspensions on these cars are very efficient or the seats are very comfortable. No, they'll show you a family going to the Grand Canyon, a family going to uh, a, a solitary beach on the Pacific Ocean, right? And all sorts of other unusual locales as if it were really different, difficult to go there these days. But the assumption is still get the automobile because your life will change as an individual or as a group, as a family. And um, this is an interesting passage. So they start going out in the automobile. They test the automobile. And her chaperone, Aunt Mary, is there. The significance of this passage, though, is that it changes radically the role of a chaperone. A chaperone in this kind of moralistic society in some areas of our own society where this is practiced, is there to make sure that a potential couple or anyone in the presence of an unmarried woman who's not related to her behave properly, following all the rules accepted within their group. She reverses that by saying, I can do everything. I can go in an automobile because I have my chaperone. That is to say, instead of the chaperone being the person who authorizes something, an event, or who vets the company she goes out with, okay, 
you cannot even be seen next to, to you, uh, even if I'm there. She just says, as long as she's with me, I can do anything because a chaperone is with me. Okay, so it's quite a reversal of the social function of the chaperone. The traditional role of the chaperone is preventing inappropriate behavior, vetting behavior meetings before they happen. And in Molly's view, it's just a way to sanction whatever behavior she finds acceptable. I can do it because as long as I bring my aunt with me, it's fine. It's acceptable. But it's not supposed to be that way. And an uh, interesting thing, because it reflects what is still going on, what happens when you or somebody you know Somebody in your family, your father, your mother, buys an automobile. They usually don't come out honestly, directly saying, I went to the leadership, I saw this automobile, it was incredible, it looked incredible, I drove it, it was fun, and I bought it even though I couldn't afford it, or even though it's more expensive than the price I had in mind when I went there. Usually that's the case, right? You go into a dealership with, say, I want to spend $30,000, and you always spend more, right? And they know about it. You go into a dealership, and you tell them, oh, I would like to try this, this, uh, I don't know, this uh, Volkswagen ID4, uh, but the trim level, because you know that the trim level is $10,000 less. And they'll say, uh, I don't have one ready, but let me take you on a ride on this. And they always try to switch from the very beginning, switch you to a better model. Because after you've felt a better model, you say, well, yeah, it's more expensive, but oh my God, how it felt. Now, as I was saying, rarely do you find people admitting to that, to this psychological manipulation. What people like to insist on is the same thing you find in this passage by Molly. Oh, there is this very practical feature. I can charge the phone wirelessly. We're talking about a $40,000 or a $30,000 expense, right? And they're, they're focusing on they have lots of cup holder or they have a, a mechanism to keep my beverages cold or they have air conditioning in the seat. They'll focus on the small optionals, the uh, accessories, right? And she does the same. She doesn't say what a powerful feeling. She says how practical, how many things it has, right? Because this way you can justify your purchase. It seems reasonable. It seems acceptable. It seems like you haven't wasted your money on a whim, driven by emotion you've committed to an enormous port purchase that would cost you a lot of money, a uh, five-year loan, etc. No, it seems reasonable because look, I spent a lot, but look how much stuff in this car. What the, the things you can do, right? I, I have an electric pickup and if I lose electricity because of a storm, I can plug the refrigerator into the back of my electric pickup and this way, food will not get spoiled, which is, is somewhat questionable in terms of actual usefulness. And I'm moving to another presentation that you find inside week four. The first passage that I want to suggest you read carefully is the passage where she's describing how difficult the automobile is to drive. All the different levers, all the different operations, and how many things you have to do with your left hand, your right, right hand, and that's very, very true. And the significance of a passage such as this is exactly to emphasize how empowering being able to drive for a woman in this kind of society can be. Right? Because she will become fluent with the technology. She'll be able to do everything. 
So it looks daunting at the beginning because it's presented as a challenge to the character going in. But won't be as much of a challenge going through the rest of the story. And of course, this is exactly what, what I told you, what I defined the third element, the thrill, the excitement that will parallel the romantic and erotic tension between the characters. And look at all the physical reactions to the automobile. The air was cold because, of course, you're hit by you're an open top car. You're hit by air at a fast speed go, coming at you quickly. But instead of making one shiver, our blood tingled with exhilaration as we flew along. You know what a chilly body Aunt Mary is? Even she didn't complain of the weather. So this means it's an overwhelming experience for everyone, including someone as old as her aunt, and hardly needed her foot warmer. This is life, said I to myself. It seemed to me that I'd never known the height of physical pleasure, physical pleasure, talk about, think about how this will develop when she comes in contact with Jack, James as the driver, until I'd driven in a motor car. It was better than dancing on a perfect floor with a perfect partner to play perfect music, better than eating when you're awfully hungry, better than holding out your hands to a fire when they're numb with cold, better than a bath after a hot, dusty railway journey, right? It's all about the feelings connected to the car. And this is still true. Remember the assignment about old cars, new cars, how do they make one feel, right? This is the chief reaction to this kind of technology. And keep in mind what I told you about the notion of natural aristocracy. There is a social aristocracy, the social ladder, the social standing of an individual in society, the elites, the upper classes, the middle classes, the lower classes, the proletarians, the lowest part of society. But then there is the understanding because of Darwin's theories applied to society in a rather crude way, there is the understanding that some individuals are endowed by nature with the skills to climb the ladder with natural, a natural form of leadership. And this happens when she meets with Jack, who pretends to be James. She immediately identifies him as a leader in society, as a member of the elite. And he's playing this part, and so he's pretending to be just a chauffeur. When she learns of that, she remarks, I almost blurted out that I had taken him for the master because he looks the part. So he has the natural qualities. And this is important because it's the foundation of the development, the blossoming of their relationship. Because again, in a classist society, she should not have entertained even the thought of falling in love with the driver. However, this, this is not any driver and therefore she's somewhat partially justified, which would have been horrid, horrid, she says, of course. And she's writing to her father. This is her father's mindset. And suddenly I was ashamed of myself because you don't get to such a level of familiarity with the staff for I had been treating him exactly like an equal. But she'll do more of that, right? Because she sees that he is a natural born leader. There is also the suggestion in the letters to his father that in the US, given the opportunity, he could get to the top of society. Um, and this is the continuation of the previous passage. This man was much better looking 
than his companion, whom I know now was the master. The opposite is true. The companion is the actual driver and Jack slash James is pretending to be just the driver, but he cannot disguise his uh, masculinity and his social prowess, right? And, and she remarks a lot on the physical and psychological qualities. He had a rather distinguished air about himself, right? He's confident. However, she says, these Englishmen in general, even the peasants, are sometimes such splendid types. She's talking about race, right? She's talking about genetics. Clear-cut features, brave, keen eyes, and all that, you know, as if their ancestors might have been Vikings. So there's this idea that certain races are more pure, have some innate qualities that distinguish them. And then one can see from the way he talks that he's an intelligent, competent young man. So he has all the right qualities to be placed higher in society. Checking the time to see when I need to switch to the film and that is going to happen uh, very soon. And this is Jack, Jack Winston, James the Driver, writing a letter to a friend, explaining his point of view, how there is not only the proximity created by the car, they're traveling together, but there is more opportunity for proximity. She has to lean forward and shout over my shoulder because she's interested in the technology, not only to give commands, but to learn about the, the car. A curious and delightful kind of understanding is growing between us. And even though there are no details to clearly, univocally identify the car, this would have been the first car driven by Molly and uh, the one that she purchased in England before the car gets damaged and they have to switch to a more modern and faster car. Notice how similar the whole chassis is to a regular carriage. Like the one uh, in the novel, this has a belt instead of gears and you have this arrangement the passengers are supposed to be sitting here. You have an additional tool if you have an occasional guest, but otherwise the passengers, so Molly and her aunt would be sitting here and James would be here maneuvering the car with various levers and pedals. And so this is what you have to imagine. And, and of course the engine is in the back in here. So producing a lot of vibrations hitting the passengers. And of course, um, this is a Daimler from, this, this particular model is probably 1980, 1898 or 99. Um, and the wheels are a combination of rubber and other materials. I don't know if this is metal probably or, or wood, but the suspensions are not very good, right? You, you have a lot of vibrations from the road as well. So this is what you have to imagine for the first part of the story. And later on, they get into this confrontation with another wealthy driver who is targeting Molly and is quite different. To confirm what I just said, in this case, the French driver is wealthy, belongs to the elites, makes no mystery about that, but is lacking the natural leadership qualities. And even his masculinity is questionable so much that he tries to help. He wants to crank up the vehicle and is not able to, both because he lacks the strength and also the dexterity to do that because it's not just about the strength. And while confronting this suitor, this person who's clearly after Molly, that Molly will invoke the assistance, the protection, the intervention of James, who will step in, show that he can 
be heroic and that's where the, the flame, the spark, uh, really becomes evident between them. So I'll stop here to switch to the film. So if you remember from last week, and by the way, uh, as usual, this is the second time we watched the film, I invite you to write notes and you can do so on your computer or one of these pages as you prefer. Last week we saw the premise to the film Christine from 1983, a horror film about an automobile called, nicknamed Christine, a Plymouth Fury uh, from 1958 that is possessed by some kind of diabolical spirit which can enslave the owner, drive the owner to madness, etc. We found, we saw the premise to the film, how the main character of Arnold, Arnie Cunningham, is a loser, an 18-year-old loser socially at the social game. And we found him in all kinds of situations confirming this. From the time he starts working on the automobile, he is attracted to because mysteriously he sees the value in Christine. We see the elements of a transformation. And this part of the film will show you the completion of the physical because the air, the way he moves, his physique, the way he doesn't need the glasses anymore, we'll see the completion of the physical and psychological transformation of Arnie. And then, however, at this point, the devil, the demon in the machine has provided the payment, right? Has provided the lure with this transformation. At that point, the machine takes the leadership. It'll be Christine trying to disconnect Arnie from his girlfriend, his friend Dennis, his circle of friends at school, even the bullies. And by the end of the film, Christine will take over and Arnie will just become her minion. And both will go to their, uh, will end up facing their, their ultimate demise. Okay? So... We'll watch about 30 minutes, continuous, and then either today or next week I'll show you a bit of the conclusion. So this is Dennis going back to Arnie's house, but keep in mind that Arnie, we've seen him turn from nerd to greaser with sleek air and dressed in a, in a more attractive way. Uh, really satisfied with the work he's doing on the car. So even the dynamic dynamics between Dennis and Arnie have changed a lot. 